Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, we're so happy to have you here. My name is Ryan, and I'd like to be the first to welcome you to our modern worship service this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm joined in worship this morning by Derek, Adia, Alex, Andrea, Jake, Kaylin, and Gary. The whole fam bam is on the stage today. Uh, we welcome all, no matter how you identify yourself or others identify you, know that you are so, so welcome in this space. We are a community of people that believes in good news for all. You are loved, you are affirmed, you are welcome in all aspects and roles in the church from visitor to leadership. We invite you to please take a moment to say hello to someone new or someone you've not seen in a while. Let's greet each other, church. invite you to please remain standing and sing this opening song with us, House of the Lord. Words will be on the screen for you. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We will shout out. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house there is of the joy. Lord. There is joy. Surely in oh. this place. We won't be quiet. Yeah. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Why? 
Let's keep on singing, church. Loving the energy this morning. Yeah. This is for the lost and lonely. Mm. For the broken and afraid. This is for those who are hurting. Hope and health is on the way. In these battles of addiction, fear is chasing after me. Oh. Whatever trouble I am facing, I will lift my hands and sing. Yeah, we believe it. I believe in miracle power, in a wonder-working God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, working wonders in my heart. It's so hard being human. Mm. So much struggle, so much pain. When I start singing hallelujah, I sing about every change. I believe in miracle power, in a wonder working God. no matter what we're bringing today, no matter what we're going through, no matter what pain, pressure, anxiety, God, we give it all to you. No matter what our country is going through, we bring it all to you, God, because you heal and you perform miracles. And you've got us and you're holding us and you're here with us in this place. And we believe that, Lord. We believe in your power, in your glory. Let's keep that in mind, church, as we sing. And I may not know what a day may bring, but I know who brings the day on the dark. When I cannot see, still my soul says, I may not know what a day may bring, but I know who brings the day. On the darkest night, when I cannot see, I still. 
Amen, church. Thank you for singing. All right, kids, you know what time it is. Come up to the front. Child of God, I'm my worst day. Oh, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. You're the reason why. I'm my best day. I'm my worst day. I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. You're the reason why. I'm so Always amazed at Ryan's voice, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, how are you guys? Good? Doing well? Yeah. So, you know, it's summer here in Arizona, right? It gets pretty hot. What are some things that we usually really, really need when it gets this hot? Water. You guys nailed it. You got my question right away. And why is water important for us? Because we sweat and we need water. Why else is water important? Hydration, right? Like, and it. It grows our food, right? We can't have food and plants and animals without water, right? Plus, also, personally, I just really like to go swimming when it's this hot, right? Like, it just feels nice, right? Water is really important. And so how many of you, I know we have a lot of athletes up here, right? But how many of you have ever watched, like, a marathon or run a 5K or 10K or half marathon? You've seen it, right? Have you guys ever done races? Everyone who's done a race like that, go ahead and raise your hand. We have a lot of athletes here, right? And when you see those races, a lot of times you see people who are there standing, holding what for the runners? A cup of water, right? Now, as the runners go by, when that hand goes out, do they go, uh, I don't like the brand of shoes you're wearing, I'm not going to give you this, right? Or they don't go, I remember you from kindergarten and you were kind of a bully, and they take the cup back. Does that happen? No. Only, yeah, and it's, and everyone's there, and if you really want the water, you just reach out and take it, right? And you know, there's a chance to get it again somewhere else in the race, right? So we want to remember that when we think about Jesus as the living water, that's water that's always going to be offered to us. It's never going to be just taken away. We don't have to do anything special to earn it. We just have to reach our hand out and take it. Because that water is something that doesn't nourish our bodies the way that drinking water does, right? It nourishes our soul and our hearts and our minds so that we get closer to God. So let's pray together, friends. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for filling me with your love and nourishing my soul. Amen. And you can head back with your families or to Sunday school. When you speak, confusion fades. Just a word. And suddenly I'm not afraid Cause you speak And freedom reigns There is hope In every single word you say I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak Why in my heart I'm listening When sorrows roll and troubles rage You whisper peace When I don't have the words to say I won't lose hope when storms won't break, you keep your word, and your promises will keep me safe. I don't want to miss one word you speak, because everything you say is life to me. 
I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm Just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are Our scripture today comes from John chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, if you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. Jonathan, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we, we have this uh, interesting passage uh, in front of us. Uh, hey, Chris. Uh, do you know what an echo is? You know how an echo works, how a, a voice comes from one person and then it bounces off and comes back? And, and if you're listening to an echo, you're never quite sure where it started, and you're pretty sure you haven't heard the end of it, but it's not always clear, and you have to listen extra hard. This text is an echo text. It has the voice of the ancients in it, and there's a lot of voice in it, a lot of resonance. 
But we're not sure where it begins, and we're pretty clear that we have yet to hear the end of it. Uh, our, our text is a wonderful gift to us, uh, and it's a story with a lot of backstory. Uh, it's also biblical comedy. It's got some irony in it, and it's a love story. Simple enough, it starts, Jesus is traveling, he's walking, he's on the road, he approaches Jacob's well at high noon. Remember those two things, high noon and Jacob's well. Here's why. He's tired, and he's thirsty, and it's the hot time of day. Who comes to the well to draw water during the middle of the day? Not someone who's planned. So something is, or, or someone who has planned, who knows that they're not welcome at the well in the early part of the day. Jesus is traveling. He hasn't planned. The woman comes to draw water. We have to ask, why is she there at midday? Jesus is walking. He's traveling. He's walking the long way from Judea north through Galilee. If you look at a map, you'll begin to wonder why, and it'll be a good wondering. It's a good question to ask. Why was Jesus in Sychar? It doesn't make sense. It, it's sort of like saying, I'm going to Tucson, so I'm headed for Albuquerque. No, that's not really how you get there. You, the only reason to go to Albuquerque is because you need to. Uh, he needed to go to Sychar, and... <laughs> I know, I'm saying things about Albuquerque that it doesn't really deserve, but you get my point. Jesus is walking the long way. And there is a reason for him to be going the long way. And it's not because he had to, but it's because he had to. Uh, to take the long way is a good way to have time to process his critics, and he had a lot of critics, to process his critics out of his head. He, 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 it's a good way to have time with God and, and getting focused back on God. And he's in Sychar, which is way out of the way to the east. It, it, and we can say, all of that is to say, it, it's not by chance that he meets this woman who comes to draw water in the high day of noon from the well. He speaks to her. He's breaking the rules, not just a rule, but rules, like multiples. A uh, couple, men do not talk to women in public, and Jews and Samaritans do not speak to one another. There's two backstories I got to tell you both of them, the backstories. Women in first century Palestine were regarded as objects of possession. A woman was the property of a man, her father or her husband. If a woman committed adultery in the first uh, century, it, it was a crime. It was not a crime, a, a moral crime, it was a property crime. You were vi she was violating the property of her husband or her father. Uh, yeah, right, wow is a good place to start in saying words. There's other words we should probably say, but we shouldn't say them out loud. Uh, um, uh, uh, and the marriage ceremony, <laughs> it hasn't changed a lot. The marriage ceremony basically transferred ownership of a woman from her father to her husband. That man gave that woman her identity, gave her her purpose, gave her any agency that she had, and it wasn't much. And so a man speaking to a woman in public extended to her value and voice and agency, that's why men in the first century did not speak to women in public. There are quite a few places in the world where that tradition continues. Men do not speak to women because it tells the woman that she has voice and agency, and the men don't want women thinking such things. That's the first story. That's why men did not speak to women. Jesus spoke to this woman. Hear that? 
The second backstory here, about 700 years before this, Jesus wasn't born yet, uh, the Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire, came down from the north. They conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah, and they carried them off. Any, anyone of significance, any mayor or any public figure or any priest, their families were all carried off up into Assyria. They were made to be servants of the Assyrians left behind the plain people, the everyday folk, the farmers, the people of the land. Anyone uh, who went was important. Anyone who stayed was unimportant. There were two stories that were happening uh, uh, for, uh, in, in the community during the time of Jesus. The, the first ones were the Samaritans are the remnant who were unimportant, and they were people of no prominence, no worth, people of the land, those left behind who had to figure out structures of community and religious institutions uh, and, and based on what they remembered. And they structured and they operated and they continued, they appointed new priests, they did all of that. And when, when the folks who got carried off came back, they said, no, you got it wrong. We, we have the remnant. And so there's this question of who changed and who didn't change. And there's this fight between the Samaritans who got left behind and the Jews that got carried off, or the Jews that got left behind and the Samaritans. It, it, it's, a, it's a strange thing. It's, it's amazing how people divide if you give them five or 600 years. Uh, um, the exiles came back saying, we're not changed. And the people who stayed there said, yeah, but you're so different than what we remember. It's, it's just a fight. And so they didn't talk to each other. That's one reason. Uh, oh, and then the other thing was uh, the, the folks who got carried off became a little obsessed about staying apart from the Assyrians. They did not intermingle with them. They didn't have children with them. They didn't marry. They, they remained separate. Uh, the, the folks who stayed were a little bit uh, less uh, enforcing of that rule. And so the accusation was, well, you Samaritans intermixed and interbred with the Assyrians. Uh, you've surrendered your identity as the people of God. At least you're less than we are. Either way, Samaritans were regarded as less than women were regarded as less than, and both groups were kept in place by the denial of conversation. This conversation happens in our text. Jesus talks to this Samaritan woman. Hear it for what it is. It is charged with division, and it's rooted in several places in the history and identity and value of people. And we haven't even gotten to the story yet. One more thing. This is not a new story. There's nothing new in the New Testament. Just give up that idea. Uh, uh, maybe my mentioning this occurring at Jacob's well is awakening in you a sparking a remembrance of another well-cited romance, a romance that happens, a love story that happens at Jacob's well. If you're wondering, hey, did I remember this from Sunday school? Yeah, you probably do. Uh, Genesis 29 begins unfolding a story about a lonely boy named Jacob coming to a well dug by his father uh, at high noon where he happens to behold, he sees a young woman named Rachel. And the story adds in Genesis quite dryly, her father's sheep. This is a taste of Old Testament masculinity. To mention a woman and sheep in the same sentence is an underhanded way to speak of the value of a woman 
at the expense of the woman by comparing her to other property owned by her father. She's being compared to her father's sheep. And men hearing this passage in a group of other men will chuckle condescendingly, ha, 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 ah, women. Uniting men in the same way as a joke does when it's in a golf foursome. Jacob was a lonely boy. He had no one. No one had him, and he needed someone to find him. Rachel was stuck with her father's sheep. And the story is that Jacob rescues Rachel from her father by watering her sheep. And Rachel rescues Jacob from his life by looking on him. And then the story says, then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. Now, sometimes that happens in stories of romance, but if that's the need that's being met by the romance, feeling of loneliness, well, I don't know how long that's going to last. I, I guess all of us have to work out the needs that we bring to a relationship. But otherwise, it, it pretty much just fits the narrative that we've watched a thousand times in hero stories, boy meets girl, Boy kisses girl, boy and girl rescue one another and eventually create a family. In this case, this family becomes a tribe, and in this case, this tribe becomes the nation Israel. Jacob and Rachel rescue a nation from destruction. That's a heroic love story, and it happened right here at the side of Jacob's well. In our New Testament version, the story is a little bit different, has a different feel. Jesus is the traveling teacher. He's brimming with heavenly wisdom. This Samaritan woman is a woman of the world. She's hardened by experience. She's been married four times. Uh, and there are obviously jokes about her or comments made about her. Otherwise, she wouldn't come to the well at noon. And like Jesus, she is thirsty for something she, but for her, she can't quite name what she's thirsty for. And we have to wonder what could these two possibly have to say to one another? It is the water that bridges the gulf. Thirst, actually, two different kinds of of thirst. The, the poor woman seems unaware of the discrepancy, which lends a kind of a comic hopelessness to her narrative, her attempt to comprehend what this man is saying to her. You're going to read the whole thing this afternoon. The comic relief of the story is not at the expense of the woman. It, the, the comic relief is what invites us to see our own hopelessness, our own struggle, our own thirst the, for things we can't quite name. We say water, but we mean something different. We can read this story and we can be united in chuckling together, each of us recognizing our own false starts, our own distractions, our own comic misstatements, not able to see the path right in front of us. Recognizing in this woman our own defensive argument about what we know, our own eagerness to put others in their proper place, and mostly being successful at putting our own foot in our own mouth. When Jesus offers her living water, she responds that, well, you have no bucket. And when she hears of water welling up to eternal life, she understands enough to say, sir, give me this water. Our laughter quiets because we can feel our own thirst and we swallow hard. And the comic relief of the story ends when Jesus says to her, go call your husband. 
And suddenly the awkwardness of this woman who's been married four times and is now living with a man who is not her husband, it overtakes us. Without the awkward details of this woman's personal story, we would have only a menial dialogue about truth and enlightenment and belief. With the details of her life, we have a reality check that saves us all. And, and let's be really clear. I want to prep you for reading this whole passage this afternoon. Be clear about the tone of the text. Jesus is not judging her. He is not shaming her. If he were, there would be clear instructions about not giving away the milk for free. Jesus is instead countering the message of his own masculine cultural religion and its stunning obsession with controlling female genitalia. And contrary to what religious people have said, uptight religious people have said through the millennia, female genitalia does not become looser from intercourse, no more than male genitalia becomes smaller. It's just a silly idea, and Jesus is not silly. The entire conversation about maintaining female virginity and female purity has a single motive, male property rights. Specifically, the families of women objectifying the bodies of their women, their daughters, to get young men to take them as wives. I speak this graphically because it's what this text is about. Jesus is making a social comment. He is engaging in the culture war of his day about the situation in which this woman exists. Out of necessity, this woman has attached herself to men, one after the other. Jesus is telling her point blank, I see you. I understand your situation. The story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman is a love story for only a person who sees you as you are, not as you pretend to be. Only one who loves you knows your deepest desire. Only one who loves you can look at your past without blinking. When something we have regarded as, well, that's terrible, that's, that's embarrassing, that's shameful. And, and we've made excuses to ourselves and others as was necessary. We uh, made penance for when, when we're sure that that thing that we did is what keeps God from loving us. When that gets brushed aside <laughs> and, and we're pulled into the water. The love of God overwhelms us and we feel the dam break. And water wells up in us, comes out of us through our eyes. All that uptightness, all that excuse making, all that penance, all that regret, it was for naught. And our feet start moving and we can hardly stop talking as we start running. We realize that we know a lot about love, real love, not, not make-believe love, but only because he told me everything I ever did. That's the woman's words to others as she ran back into the city. He told me everything I ever did. Like our Samaritan sister, we too have struggled to believe because we read the word believe from the 21st century and we've been taught to believe that belief 
means something with intellectual ascribing to whatever the person is saying about Jesus. We've tied ourselves in knots with all sorts of superstitions and beliefs that we've been, what, what do you believe about Jesus? We think it's about mental ascribing to whatever someone says about Jesus. We've made some tragic and some comic steps in the process and we've missed the definition of belief. The, the Greek word is pisteo. And it simply means if I believe in you, then what is important to you becomes important to me. If I believe in you, then what is important to you becomes important to me. For us to say that we believe in Jesus simply means what is important to Jesus becomes important to us. And what is important to Jesus is this Samaritan woman. He can see her. We might expect that as we get near the end of this story, Jesus is going to accompany this woman into her village and he's going to advocate to her for her. He's going to validate her. He's going to speak on her behalf. He's going to mansplain. Fortunately, that is not what happens in this story. She goes. She runs. She leaves him behind. She tells others. She uses her voice. What a better gift can there be? Water welling up evidently moistens the dry, weakened, cracked voice. Water of life brings resonance to our voice. And speaking up changes our world. Oh, this is a love story indeed. And the story is not quite done yet. We might expect that the giver of water and voice, the, the hero Jesus is going to ride off on a powerful horse and ascend into a victorious life, taken into heaven by a fiery chair. No, none of that. He chooses the foolish way of the cross, riding a small donkey through a crowd of normal everyday people. He chooses to be silent as a suffering servant. He, he practices failure in the eyes of the world. With, with near unbearable irony, the keeper of living water will say to Roman and religious leaders as they execute him, I thirst. Do you really think that's disconnected from our text today? And once he is dead and he's hanging on the cross, someone will stab him with a spear and out will flow water and blood. Do you really believe that's disconnected from our story today? I think that's the best evidence that this is a love story. It's like an echo. We're not quite sure where it begins, and we're really sure it's not quite ending, and there are too many levels and connections and meanings and double entendres and ironic twists, voices speaking for any of us to offer a final word about its meaning. The woman passed by. Did you see her? We certainly heard her. And we've reached that time where more words are not going to be helpful. And each of us must go home and read this story and think about its meaning. We have to ponder. We have to wait for the times that Jesus comes to each of us. When it will be your moment to be rescued about which you can run and tell. Thanks be to God. Amen. I actually, while the band comes back up, how about we, um, would you pray with me?
We're out past where words describe what we believe, God. What we believe is that you have possession of us, and that is enough. What we believe is that you created all of us. And our value is no more negotiable than the chemical composition of salt. It, it doesn't change. It just is. And we breathe in our value, and we breathe in our worth, and we breathe in your grasp on us. And we hold it like water that gives us life, and then we let it go like water we breathe out with each breath. Keep us moving forward in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please take this time to consider how you'd like to support the ministry and mission of this church. If you're a first-time visitor, please know we don't expect you to give anything. But um, if you consider PVMC your home church, you can give online at pvmc.org or in the baskets on our welcome tables as you leave. Is what we do. Uh, it's one of the ways given to us to act on, to experience, to draw close to Jesus. He's at the table with his disciples. We come to the table as disciples. He said, this is my body, this bread. Eat this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my lifeblood in this cup. He was talking about wine. We use grape juice. He said, this is my lifeblood poured out for you and for many. Drink this and remember me. And so we come. We take a piece of bread. We got gluten-free. We got regular. We got juice. We dip. We eat. We enter into communion with Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to ascribe to a set of beliefs. The question is, what will Jesus do in you as his body and his blood course through your veins? Will you come? I'd like to invite those who will be helping this morning to come, and we'll form a couple of stations you walk through slow the silence where your voice can go who is worthy of the warmth of an open fire the celebration of a wedding choir tell me who broken sanctuary light I'm surrendered I am baptized I can see you even though I'm blind cause this world is made of color in the stained glass church of ordinary life I'm surrendered I am baptized I can hold you like a dandelion Cause this world is made of color Am I worthy of 
The chances I'm surrounded with The shame that I am drowning The salt in my woundedness Am I worthy of The pain that I buried in the dust Of a God who I am scared to trust Tell me, am I worthy of it? In the broken sanctuary light, I'm surrendered, I am hypnotized. I can see you even though I'm blind, cause this world is made of color. In the stained glass church of ordinary life, I'm surrendered. I can hold you like a dandelion Cause this world is made of color Cause this world is made of color And when I go Trace my steps to those stone cold lonely nights when my soul was so tired of putting up a fight. Built my house on sand, didn't understand. I thought truth was black and white, but you took my hand, and this world was made of color. Sanctuary light I'm surrendered I am hypnotized I can see you Even though I'm blind Cause this world is Made of color In the stained glass Church of ordinary life I'm surrendered I am baptized I can hold you Like a dandelion Cause this world This world is made of color. Cause this world is made of color. Cause this world is made of color. Here's, here's our benediction. It, it doesn't seem right to sit and then walk out quietly, not after, not after this text. So I, 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 I have to say this benediction, get out. You need to be running. You're, you, you came here and you've had an encounter and, and sitting and waiting and walking aren't quite suited. Get out. We invite you to please stand and sing this last song with us. In a time full of war, be at peace. In a time full of doubt, just be at peace. Yeah, there ain't that much difference between you and me In a time full of war, be peace In a world full of hate, be alive When you do somebody wrong, make it right Don't hide in the 
dark, you were born to shine in a world full of hate me alive. La 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 la. In a place that needs change, make a difference. In a time full of noise, just this. Life is but a breeze, better living. In a place that needs a change, make a difference. In a world full of hate, be alive. When you do somebody wrong, make it right. Oh, don't hide in the dark, you were born to shine. In a world full of hate. The finish line is six feet in the ground. In a race you can win, just slow down. In a world full of hate, be alive. Oh, when you do somebody wrong, make it right, make it right. Don't hide in the dark, you were born to shine. In a world full of hate. It's hard living color when you just see black and white in a world full of hate be alive. Thank you so much for singing with us, y'all. Have a wonderful rest of your day.